Good afternoon. This is Derek from South Africa. While having a cup of coffee, let us look at some of the scriptures. We're just looking at Luke chapter 21, verse 34. Jesus says, Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Here if we look at the word escape, it says that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things. Escape, uh, it's Strong's 1628, comes from the root ek, which means out of. So it's not, it's not saying that you'll go through these things, but that you'll escape all these things. That's what the Greek clearly shows. So it says, watch therefore and pray. And I've noticed some of the prophetic ministries recently have been saying that it's pray, pray, pray. And it's because when he comes, we need to be in a place of prayer. Because if we, if we are people of prayer, he will not come to us as a thief in the night. He comes as a thief in the night to those that do not know him. Uh, those who are living and walking in darkness, but those who are watching and praying, he does not come as a thief in the night. The scripture says that the day of the Lord only comes as a thief of the night to the unbeliever, those who are walking in darkness. Because if, you, if you're living in him, in his presence, you will know the times and the seasons. You will know when it's a time for, him, for his coming. You will, you will not say that he's coming in 50 years or 100 years time. If you are a person that's watching and praying, you will know uh, the closeness, the nearness of his coming. But the issue is most of the people in the body of Christ do not understand how to pray unceasingly. Some say, just let's pray for one hour a day. And, but to, to come to a place of praying unceasingly and it's not praying in tongues all the time that is not praying without ceasing and this is a mystery to many but it has been revealed to his people in the past and, and this is actually the key of watching and praying and I'm going to go to two other scriptures and this is going to become clearer. Uh, let us turn now to Revelation chapter 3, the Philadelphian church. Remember there are three, uh, you see the church of Sardis, the church of Philadelphia, and the church of Laodicea. So you've got the three churches, that prophetically they're speaking of different time period of, of the Sardis was of the time of the Reformation and the church there became very intellectual much of the intellect and if you look at the words in Revelation chapter 3 that Jesus wasn't very happy with with that church but if you look at the church of Philadelphia it's very different and that According to Watchman Lee, he spoke of this church, he's saying that the foundation of that was very much the works of people like Jean Guyon, Michael Molinos. In other words, saying that foundation was of basically of praying without ceasing and having an inner devotion of living not in the outer court, but being inner court Christians that are living in the tent, living in him. And out of this this foundation which spread throughout of Europe and many nations is almost a revival at that time um, as, as many people realized that the ceremonies and a lot of what was being done in the church at the time it had no very little substance it was church services you know and doing this and doing that but there was something missing and there came a time where this revelation came into, into Europe of, of this heart relationship with the Lord and 
of course, it starts with being born again. Uh, but even within the church itself, it, it many had lost this. They didn't have the full revelation of it. And this was came throughout Europe. And eventually the Moravian brethren were very influenced by, by this. And they had open doors. That's where the missionary movement started and went throughout the nations. And it all came forth from this this deeper um, abiding in him, this deeper walk which people were coming to know throughout Europe and many other nations. God was awakening the people of God. And this is the Philadelphian church. And I'm just going to show you a few little nuggets here as well. Um, if we look at verse 10, um, here I'm reading not from the New King James, but from the Amplified. It says, Because you have guarded and kept my word of patient endurance, have held fast the lesson of my patience with the expectant endurance that I give you. I will keep you safe from the hour of trial, testing that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. This is speaking of what happens during the, the tribulation period. Um, and the word there from, I will keep you safe from the hour of trial. That's also the same Greek word. It comes from the root ek. It's not going through the hour of trial, but we kept from the hour of trial. In other words, that the rapture of the church occurs before that, and we will be in heaven. Those who are found worthy. And if you look carefully at this, that in the in this church of Philadelphia, the church as a whole is found worthy. Uh, it says, I'm hold I'm coming quickly, hold fast what you have, so that no one may rob you and deprive you of your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the sanctuary of my God. And his only admonition to the, this church is to hold fast what you have, to guard it, and to guard your mes my message. In other words, people might try and persuade you to take you away from this message into some other stream. They might want you to, to follow their church or this movement. But he says, hold fast what you have. That so that no one may rob you and deprive you of your crown. Because if you go a little back to the church of Sardis, which is really the uh, the, the church of the Reformation era, era uh, the, the, it speaks of that only a few will be found worthy. Um, in other words, the church as a whole is not found worthy. I'm just going a little back to that. Uh, just hold on. Just okay. Uh, here I'm, I'm looking at here the. I'm also in the still in the Amplified. I normally read from the New King James, but I'm just looking here with the Amplified today. It says in verse 4, this is also in chapter, Revelation chapter 3, Yet you still have a few persons, names in Sardis, who have not soiled their clothes, and they shall walk with me in white, because they are worthy and deserving. But as a whole, the church of Sardis, you notice they are not worthy. Uh, it says their works are not acceptable. It says here, for I found, I've not found a thing that you have done. I've not found a thing that you have done, any work of yours, meeting the requirements of my God, or perfect in his sight. And in case you will not rouse yourselves and keep awake and watch, I will come upon you like a thief, and you will not know or suspect in what hour I will come. 
in other words, works that are done that are not based from the, the courts of God. In other words, if one lives more in the outer court as a Christian, the works that are done are not perfect. But if your works are done while living in the inner court, ready in Christ, then those works are acceptable to God because they'll be done through the Spirit of God and they'll be done, no, they won't be in the flesh, they'll be in, in Him. But in the, the Church of Sardis, um, as in historically it was the time of the Reformation and they started to move more into, into the realm of the intellect and they didn't have a deep heart a walk with God, a relationship that didn't have the depths of Jesus Christ. And so what happened is they were still doing works, but they weren't living in a place of prayer, a continual prayer of deep worship where they breathed and lived in His presence day by day, moment by moment. That wasn't true in, in their lives, but they were still doing works. And these works were not perfect before God. And he says here that if you you need to watch, keep awake and watch, others watch and pray. This is to the church of Sardis, because you see they weren't living in a place of prayer. They'd become more of the intellect and have a very much that way in the gospel, the way it was coming forth. And it was only a bit later in the time of there were people like Molin, Oscurion, and it started spreading throughout the nations in Europe. God was awakening people, and out of this came the great missionary movement. It was almost the second part of, of the Great Reformation. And that we see in the next church in, in Philadelphia. But here yeah, I'm just showing you the importance of, of coming to a place of praying continuously where prayer becomes your life and that is actually true in the next church in Philadelphian church and there's some important uh, truths here as well with the Philadelphian church it says also uh, and to the angel this is an introduction to the, the church of Philadelphia and to the angel or the messenger of the assembly church in Philadelphia right these are the words of the Holy One the true one he who has the key of David who opens and no one shut who shuts and no one shall open in other words it says that Jesus here is, comes introduces himself to the church as the one who has the key of David and he opens doors and no one can close them when he opens it and when he shuts a door no one can open that shut door just moving so this is quite important um, because it shows you that that if you live in the inner court, in this place, in Him, He will actually open doors. And the other churches, you see that they don't have that because they're not living in the place. If you live in the outer court, you'll find that these doors don't open. So I'm just moving back. It says in verse 8, See, I have set before you a door wide open, which no one is able to shut. That was very much a missionary door. Um, through the Moravian brethren, basically the gospel went out through to the world, but it came through this, this deeper walk in him where they lived in the, the inner courts of God. And we see this a bit later on. It's also hinted to here. It says, he who overcomes is victorious, in verse 12. I will make him a pillar in the sanctuary of my God. He will never be put out of it, or go out of it. In other words, you're saying that he will be in the, 
the temple continued in the sanctuary continued you'll never be put out of it or go out of it in other words if here on earth you're living in the in the tent continually in, in, uh, not in the outer court but in the in inner court that you'll be part of one in heaven the ones that live close in his presence in his sanctuary that's what he's actually implying here as well and it's quite it's of significant that also that Jesus holds this key the key of David he hasn't given it ready to this church in other words when you're living in his presence uh, the doors are open because you do things in the spirit in him it's not something you can just wield as with, with charismatic witchcraft you can't just take the keys and just bind and loose and do things and use them yourself you can even take the word and do this it can be a form of spiritual witchcraft but here it's very really different he still holds the key Jesus still holds the key of David so we as we walk according to his will and this door the door opens so that's it's quite important just to see that he holds that key as well so something that's important here it says it says I know that you have but little power that's also a hint of, of the message, the gospel that's coming forth here in this church. Because it's the, the message is the way of the cross. And the cross is where it's none of your power. It's none of your strength. You don't minister in your own strength. But it's a place where you come to rely on the Lord himself. And you move with his strength and his ability. So it is a place of little power. And it's also in verse 10 it says, Keep the word of patient endurance. And if you, I'm looking at the notes here, it's, it's from Thayer's, a Greek English lexicon of the New Testament. That the Greek which we translate of patient endurance paints a picture of a patient, steadfast waiting for someone or something. And that's very much how the gospel, how the uh, the doctrine and what's being taught uh, by these people in this in this this church, how it comes forth is very much a waiting on the Lord, and that that actually sums up what what it's actually very much what it's about. And the waiting and the watching is not just watching for signs. One can actually become very sensationalist by watching certain signs as they unfold. We still need to watch the signs as the things uh, start. We see them, the earthquakes, the great earthquakes, and the beginnings of even World War Three. As we see these things in Ezekiel um, 38, 39, the, as these things start to unfold right near the end, we'll see these signs. But the watching is, is not about just watching the, the signs as they take place. It's about being in a place of prayer in Him and having a deep walk where one, one lives and one breathes and one moves in Him. And also if we just look at Revelation uh, chapter 8, I'm just going to it here, verse 9. This is in, in the New King James. It says, After these things I looked and behold a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white rows with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice saying salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb 
all the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God saying Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom thanksgiving and honour and power and might be to our God forever and ever Amen Then one of the elders answered saying to me Who are these arrayed in white robes and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. And that's John speaking. And he said to me, These are the ones who came, who come out of the great tribulation. And that's the same word, ek, which doesn't mean that they were martyred in the great tribulation, but they were they escaped the the great tribulation. They, they basically escaped not only the Great Tribulation, the Tribulation period. So one has to be careful how one translates this. Because this is also the beginning of the Tribulation. And we see the one the Jewish people mentioned, the 144. So as it moves uh, from the, the church to the back to the Jewish people, we see two people mentioned here. First, the, the 144,000 Jewish people who are going to be um, prominent in, in this seven year period and then he explains this other multitude which are those that have just come out of before the tribulation started this is where the church is before standing before God in heaven and it's here it says uh, Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. He who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore, etc. For, and you'll shepherd them and lead them to the fountain of living waters and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there's a lot of, it's very similar also to, to that which is addressed to the Philadelphian church as well there. So today I'm just bringing a few nuggets and a few truths here with the Philadelphian church and the importance of of coming to this place of of praying unceasingly, especially in the time of the Lord's coming of the rapture. He says, watch and pray and one needs to look at this very carefully because it's not you can't just pray all the time we're all involved in work uh, and we need to be in a place where we can live in his presence even in the midst of our work our daily work and how this all comes together and it's very important that one has a, a depth here of living in him It's very, very important that one has this foundation. Because many in the body of Christ, many are teaching uh, other things today. For example, I listen to a ministry, and they've got a tremendous prophetic ministry. It's a Jewish ministry. I won't mention the name of the person. And it's clearly been gifted with. Uh, so uh, very powerful visions and prophetic words that's come forth very powerful but th then you hear him in his devotional saying oh I was reading E.W. Kenyon how can a, a, a prophet of God with such a gifting in that have no discernment and do have a foundation that he's looking at people like E.W. Kenyon, in other words it's all in the word faith and that whole foundation okay because this guy was from you know had comes from ORU and with a background that way but he says he's left the, the whole prosperity gospel and the foundations with that but but then when you hear him on Facebook saying with the devotions that he's reading E.W. Kenyon, what is happening? 
that foundation is completely contrary to the stream that I'm speaking of. Can one mix different streams? No. Some others are, are bringing end time events, news, news events, but as you listen to them, there's no peace, there's no, they're not living, this foundation is not true in their lives. Are they really watching and praying? Others, some, some others are, have a gospel of, of self-esteem. We, where the cross doesn't come really into play because in this the stream that I'm speaking of the cross comes into effect it's not a self-esteem gospel and that comes sometimes I've seen it in Bible schools even the Bible school I went to many years ago under discipleship they had some self-esteem truths that they bring it's almost worldly things they bring into the Bible schools one can't have a mixture like this when you're walking in the stream, you've got to guard this, you hold fast what you have. You need to guard this. So I see that in most ministries today, that people haven't grasped this foundation. Most are in something else. And even with them, um, using words. Some say you can say what you have and it's a, that's a different stream completely, completely different to what I'm speaking of and it's almost like charismatic witchcraft and things can become twisted and very distorted. So I'm rather disturbed when I actually listen to people even um, on YouTube and to various ministries, there are very few that actually are in the stream of the Philadelphian Church. And it's very, very important, especially in the time that we're living right in the time for His coming, that we need clarity here. We need an understanding, we need a depth here, and a soundness that we truly establish in the Church of Philadelphia. And as he says, because you have guarded and kept my word of patient endurance, I will keep you safe from the hour of trial, testing, which has come on the whole world, which is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell upon the earth. So those people during the tribulation, that's a time of testing trial and it's really what God does if if you don't pass a test he takes you back to the same test and you've got to redo the test and you continue you, you've got to re redo the test until you pass that test and th that is why people that have been through this foundation they've passed the test uh, there's a test of the cross that comes very deeply in this and then one comes to a place where one basically lives in him in the inner court one's past it, one's living in the tent itself so there's a test so when you've passed the test he's saying you don't have to go through the, the test of the last seven years the tribulation because you've really passed the test you're really an overcomer but those who have not passed the test You'll have to go through the tribulation and what's to come. Those who have not overcome, they will have to, uh, you'll be tested in the, in the tribulation period. And it's, it's the same, it says, here it says, he who overcomes, is, who is victorious, I'll make him a pillar in the sanctuary of my God. And you'll never be you'll go out of it. It's the same thing. If if you've passed the test here, and you're living 
in this inner court in him then um, then in heaven it will be the same so one can see how, how it's coming forth the truth here in this in this chapter but it's I'm just trying to bring across the importance of this of being truly of the stream in the Philadelphian church you don't want to be found in the Laodicean church or Sardis and it's all about knowing Jesus deeply so it's a way of the cross and of a deep pre-life in him where one lives and breathes and dwells in his presence and that's really the message from these people from the 1600s and this is what Watchman Nee was emphasizing as well saying why it's, it's so important and it's a key to, to true revival to the doors being opened that in other words God will open doors with this uh, yeah it's not it's, it's basically he has the key the key of David and he will open the doors as one lives in the inner court as you live in the inner court you do things in God and in, in the spirit and he will open things and one's works will be acceptable to him if your works are done while you if you're dwelling in the outer court in other words you're doing things you can do works church works you can be doing even evangelism you can do all things you're doing it in your own strength and you're doing it yourself those works are not acceptable to God it's only if you've done them while living in the inner court, not in the outer court, in Christ, in Him. When you're living in Him, everything will be acceptable in Him. And that's the picture of the Philadelphian church. It's very, very important. It says, take note I'll, in verse 9, I'll make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and not but lie, behold, I'll make them come and bow down before your feet and learn and, and acknowledge that I've loved you. And there's a special discernment I've noticed that as one lives in him and one's in this, this foundation, that you come across Christians of a false spirit or of some, some other do, following some other movement or something, immediately something that's false in him, you can detect it. There's a, such a discernment, and they often know it themselves. And you find there's often a conflict between almost between angels and devils. You find yourself actually in quite a war. What happens? And you're going to a ministry or into a church, and they not walking in, in him, they're, they're, not, they're not grounded in this foundation they'll immediately recognize it and so you'll find that it's almost like a conflict that takes place and this is what in verse 9 speaks of anything that's false and that sort of is a, eventually they will they'll acknowledge and they'll see that with this but it exposes this and that's something that very prominently comes out with this that those that walk truly in this way or deep in him this this manifests all the time so every every verse every all the words what Jesus said to the church of Philadelphia they all have a meaning and there's more behind it than what's written there that the Holy Spirit will open up this everything is there's such a lot of truth that's hidden in here which is actually true
And I've just touched on a few of the points here today. And there's actually much more with this as well. I'm just emphasizing the importance of of prayer in these last days and coming to a place of of praying unceasingly and to a place where one dwells in Him, where one lives in Him and lives in the inner court in God. That is just what I'm bringing forth today, just a few nuggets concerning the Church of Philadelphia. God bless.